I'm not interesting to look at, so I have a presentation for you, so you can look over there. Um, but uh, I'm looking at it sideways myself, so I uh, have my laptop in my lap, so I apologize for the, the uh, logistics. Um, all right, uh, I am also, like Richard, deeply honored to be here. In fact, I'm thrilled to be here. And I wanted, again, to express our, our appreciation for the wonderful Rima Khalaf, who is not only created uh, this event and the um, uh, study, uh, given the, the space and the opportunity to for us to conduct the study, but stood up to the forces of Israel and the United States in their worst form in the most uh, inspiring way. And I um, ask, now that she's back in the room, I would ask everyone to give her an ovation that she deserves. <laughs> like all academics, I'm long-winded. So I will try very hard to do this in my allotted time. Um, I want to um, highlight that uh, the, this um, presentation is based on um, sources that are available to you. Um, I just have to get myself organized here. Um, the uh, first one uh, is a trio of books that came out together um, by uh, Mazen Komsia, uh, myself, and Ali Ab Abunima, who I hope is in the room. Ali, are you here? All right, all right, people are pointing at him uh, so that he's caught. Um, uh, the wonderful book, One Country, which I highly recommend. In fact, sometimes I'm embarrassed to discover that not much of what I'm saying is original at all. It all was said better by Ali before I got around to it. Um, the other thing, uh, though, is a study that was conducted by the South African um, Human Sciences Research Council I had the privilege of directing that study, but it was written by a team of legal scholars, and it was the first major study of uh, apartheid in the occupied territories. That study led to the publication of that in, as a, a book in English called Beyond Occupation. Lawyers in the room, I think, will find that useful. Others may find it a bit dense. Um, and finally, the study that Rima facilitated uh, through the United Nations uh, that, um, that uh, Richard and I uh, put together that is now in French, Italian, and Arabic translations. Uh, there is no Turkish translation yet. Hint, hint. Um, so you, the, you are able to get at least an Arabic translation of that one. Um, what I would like to talk about are the implications of this report, which have not yet been explored very much. Um, and I propose to you that these implications are, in fact, very major. They, the finding of apartheid changes our entire way of looking at the conflict, or at least it suggests this. Uh, and I, it, we have a term from social science called a paradigm shift. And the um, shift we are talking about here is moving from the occupation paradigm to the apartheid paradigm, which Richard calls the occupation discourse or the apartheid discourse, same concept. Um, let us think about the dominant view that has prevailed over the last few decades, especially through the Oslo period, which I call the occupation paradigm. This paradigm says that Israel is the belligerent occupier of the West Bank and Gaza Strip, uh, this is legally true. There's no question about that. Um, this traces the problem to the 1967 war. 
Uh, and the idea is that this conflict in this form will be ended by ending the occupation. Uh, in this view, the occupation is temporary. Israel must withdraw from the occupied territories, and therefore, somehow, it will withdraw because retaining the territories would violate international law, which prohibits acquiring territory by force. This assumes that the Palestinians are a people with a right to self-determination in Mandate Palestine, and that the Jews are also a separate people with the right to self-determination in Israel. It assumes that Israel will remain a Jewish state, and therefore that Israel's withdrawal from the occupied territories will allow a Palestinian state to form, creating a two-state solution. All of this should be very familiar to you. This does aim at two states, a state of Israel, the borders are not established, and a state of Palestine in the occupied territories. This rests on something called the principle of partition, which Israel constantly talks about. Uh, it has been reinforced by one UN resolution in 1947, which many people know about, which suggested dividing the land into an Arab state and a Jewish state. This is the binational model, which is sometimes called two peoples in one land or two states for two peoples. There is diplomatic and legal support for partition. It was implicit in the Oslo Accords, although importantly, not spelled out. The Oslo Accords never mentioned two states. So we discovered that a little late. The roadmap uh, uh, pushed by the Bush administration of the United States made it explicit. There were to be two states. We have three, at least, Security Council resolutions also talking about the vision of two states, uh, Palestinian state and Israel. This is translated into a political program of the Palestinian Authority to seek recognition by UN member states. And uh, that has had some success. Uh, 137 states to date have recognized a state of Palestine. So one thing about this, though, is that the occupation paradigm accepts the fragmentation of the Palestinian people and the Palestinian problem. This was the major finding of the ESQA report. It conceptually, legally, ideologically, and normatively divides the entire problem into four separate categories, each having its own politics and law. One is the citizens of Israel, Palestinian citizens of Israel, Palestinian residents of Jerusalem, Palestinians living in the occupied territories, Palestinians living in as refugees and forced exiles. The purpose of this fragmentation is to protect Jewish democracy. And by that, I mean the legal formulation of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. It limits the minority, Palestinian minority inside Israel to an amount that is safely small so that it doesn't matter if they have the vote because there are not enough of them to change the laws of the state. It also casts the problem as an international problem, one of belligerent occupation and Israeli withdrawal. This is the paradigm that has failed. And it has failed most dramatically through the annexation of the West Bank by Israel through the construction of the settlements. I won't go into that because most of you know about that. But we are looking now at half a million settlers in the West Bank in enormous settlement cities that are not going to be dismantled or removed. These are uh, an infrastructure that costs hundreds of billions of dollars 
and it is not going anywhere. In this landscape, Palestinians have been reduced to cantons or racial reserves, and it is in these cantons that the Palestinian state is supposed to form. The trouble with this is that a Palestinian state can only exist in such a landscape with open borders. It has always been known to be impossible to divide Palestine in any way that shut off one part of the country from another part. All through the British mandate, even the Peel Commission, which is sometimes cited, everyone found partition to be impossible. Even Resolution 181 in 1987 called for partition with economic union because it was clear that borders in any part of the land would be unworkable. The problem is that Jewish statehood requires closed borders. The reason is that Jewish national domination is race-based. It requires strict demographic segregation of Jews and non-Jews throughout the territory under Israel's control. This is not unique to Israel. It is true of Australia, South Africa. Any such racial democracy faces the same problem. It requires that, therefore, that the Palestinian state never be able to challenge those borders or to escape that situation, which means it must remain economically and politically dependent on Israel. And that requires full Israeli control over those borders. And here we come to the crux of it. The occupation itself protects Israel from the demographic threat of non-Jews, the non-Jewish folk. What this means is that the occupation itself is essential to Israel, as long as Israel remains a Jewish state. For Israel, a Palestinian state must be a Bantustan. And this raises the question of what is a Bantustan. But now I'm going to talk briefly about international law, defining apartheid. We don't have time for me to get into this in detail. I will just say that there is a law, the International Convention on Apartheid, which defines the crime of apartheid. And there is also the Rome Statute of the Criminal Court, which does this too. And what happened with our study was we simply matched up Israel's practices to the definition of apartheid, and we found that indeed that is what we see. We have a regime, it talks about a regime, yes. It talks about the purpose to dominate, yes. It talks about the racial character of the conflict. We don't have time for me to explain this now, but this is a racial conflict because both identities are based on dissent in Israeli ideology. And it involves inhuman acts of a, of a set of, uh, that are spelled out in the convention. Um, the sources I mentioned earlier provide this in detail. The other way to think of this, though, is as an integrated system in which the four domains combine law and policy in such a way as to create one comprehensive apartheid regime. This was the major finding of our report, and it was the one that transformed our understanding of the conflict itself. I'd like to talk quickly about the Bantu stands, though, uh, because this was a feature of South African apartheid that was most famous and which we see now in Palestine quite dramatically. This, we see it in the fragmentation of the land. You'll see in the lower right-hand corner the famous cantons of the West Bank see the same kind of geography in South Africa in the Bantustans forming a, a series of um, cantons there. 
This is strategic so that the cantons are divided by the dominant society's land. Within this territory, the regime installs national governments to provide for the supposed self-determination of the peoples that the regime had defined. In South Africa, that was the Zulu, the Swana, the Sutu, the different peoples of South Africa. Then the regimes installed self-government authorities. In South Africa, this was called the Bantu self-government authorities. Guess what it's called in the Oslo Accords? We have to remember here that Israel and South Africa were close allies through the entire apartheid period. They consulted constantly about their similar situation, and it is impossible that they did not learn from each other. I also have some data on that that I'm not entirely at liberty to share, but I know that they did. Um, now, the Bantustan system is, has four general functions. One is denationalization. This is the South African term, but it works here too. To transfer citizenship and rights to the Bantustan government. In South Africa, this meant taking away the citizenship of black South Africans. In the West Bank, it means giving stateless people citizenship in the Bantustan. Pacification, making the Bantustan government itself responsible for repressing dissent. There was an armies in the Bantustan. In the top photograph, you see the Bofutswana army. In the lower one, you see the Palestinian Authority armed forces. Economic dependency to ensure that the Bantustan economy remains vulnerable and subordinate to the dominant economy and political dependency, make the Bantustan government dependent on the dominant power. Indeed, this is a proxy rule system through which the government of the Bantustan remains in power only as long as it performs these functions. Viewing the conflict through this lens, we come to the apartheid paradigm, which gives a very different model. Israel is a Jewish democracy as an apartheid regime. A partition into two states has no rationale other than to perpetuate apartheid in one of them. Israel would remain an apartheid regime. The Palestinian state is the Bantustan with its separate development. That is illegal. Apartheid is a crime against humanity. Any solution that perpetuates apartheid is therefore illegal. It is not ended by moving a border. And there is no special case for Israel. The only solution consistent with international law is to unify mandate Palestine as one non-racial state. So I don't have time to go into the uh, main differences between these two paradigms, but I'll just highlight a couple of them. The one that I find most important is that the con in the occupation paradigm, the conflict traces to the Six-Day War. In the apartheid paradigm, it traces at least to the Balfour Declaration. In the occupation paradigm, the state of Israel is a legal given. It's accepted. It's recognized. It's sitting there. It's a state. In the um, apartheid paradigm, the state of Israel is a racial state, and that is illegal. I don't have time to go into the rest of these, so I will just show you. Is it OK? I'll come back to them in discussion. Yeah. OK, well, if we, you want, I can go through some of these again. But the one that I want to end on is that um, in the final analysis of all of these comparisons, which I think deserves a um, lot more attention, 
the Jewish statehood in the occupation paradigm, Jewish statehood is considered legitimate. In the apartheid paradigm, Jewish statehood is not legitimate. It has nothing to do with being Jewish per se. It has to do with being an apartheid regime. It has to do with being an ethnic nationalism, which nobody gets to do, even Jews, who have had a terrible history and a better argument than some for having one. Um, I wanted to close uh, with this slide. I'm kind of rushing here. But um, what I wanted to uh, get across here is that moving to the apartheid paradigm and moving to a unification paradigm in which apartheid is broken down, a state is formed that grants everyone equal rights and citizenship does require, it does suggest the need to rethink the national identities. A Palestinian state would go back to what it was originally back in 1922, at the beginning of the mandate, a multi-sectarian, non-ethnic, inclusive state based on the territory of Mandate Palestine, a civic nationalism. It has been a very interesting thing to me to realize how much Zionism distorted that nationalism by extracting Jewishness out of it and redefining Palestinian as non-Jewish, not explicitly, but implicitly. Rethinking Palestinian nationalism is therefore what seems to be on the table now. And here again, I'm going to embarrass Ali Abu Nima because his book on one country, and two books, his book on one country and the battle for justice, get into this in a level of detail that I think is very illuminating. And I ask you to chase him down and talk to him after this is over. Uh, I will close on that, and um, thank you very much for your time and attention. <laughs>